Okay, so now if we go back to um, our thoughts about what we need to make an experiment, we have the first four things, but we don't have any logging and we don't have this port communication, which we're not, not going to look at anyway. Um, but we need to log and we need to measure time. And measuring time is actually non-trivial. So if you have an experiment where the order of magnitude of time are seconds anyway, so if you simply want to see if there was a two second difference, then all of what I'm telling you here is not that important. But especially if you're working with EEG or something, measuring time precisely is incredibly important. And you want to make sure that you are measuring at least millisecond accuracy or something. So make sure that you know how precisely you want to measure time and then make sure that you figure out how to do this well. So accurate timing can be crucial for many, many kinds of experiments. So be aware of how you do it. The standard way of how one would do it is simply using Python's time.time .time and then subtracting the start time from uh, the current time. And we see already that if we sleep one second, so this is only precise uh, for, so this is wrong with 14 milliseconds, which is not too good, is it? So depending, 14 milliseconds can be a lot in your experiment and you have to make sure if that is the case. So generally a good idea, Python's time function is not as accurate as you may think. Um, and I found in these two sources that time.time .time for Linux and Mac is rather precise. So 0.001 milliseconds. Yes, we can confirm this. No, we cannot confirm this is milliseconds, not seconds. I just don't know. And for Windows, the precision is um, plus minus 16 milliseconds, which is a lot um, due to clock implementation problems, due to process interrupts. So not too well. For measuring time difference, Python wants you to use the performance counter, time.perf counter, which automatically uses the most accurate measure of time your system provides. For Windows, which is it's one that doesn't have these interrupt problems and doesn't rely on the Windows clock. So this is allegedly more precise. But keep in mind that there are many differences among CPUs, operating systems, etc. etc. Don't use time.clock, it's deprecated since Python 3.3, so I'm using it here and Python will tell me that it's deprecated and also it doesn't actually matter the time we slept because it behaves differently on Unix and Windows. So in Unix, this returns the current processor time, so blah blah, it doesn't um, tell me when I sleep and if you run this on Windows, I think it uh, tells you, if you, so this would show 1.002 whatever. So this is different. Make sure that you know what you're doing here. Um, yes. So using time.perf counter minus the process time looks to be more precise. So here I'm making sure that I use both. So I'm measuring both the time um, my system spent inside this process and the time my system spent in general and um, subtracting them is actually a more precise measure because my operating system also did other things while it slept here and then it was too late because it was busy doing other things and came back to this process too late. Okay, um, Pygame and timing, I cannot run this because I uh, use the good microphone right now. Um, Pygame automatically so simply shows for its own stopwatch which you can use. Um, it shows the timer resolution, which it tells me to be 10 milliseconds here on my system. I don't know how trustworthy that is. I just know that this is diff so this is um, tailored for my system right now, and for yours it's, it may look different. But I'm not sure how trustworthy this value is. Um, experiments timing. So now I have two different sources because I read the paper in which they introduced experiment and they, they said since Python wraps the function for getting the system time, the accuracy of experiments timing is more precise than milliseconds. Then I read another paper where it says, wow, it's off by at least 20 milliseconds. So allegedly it uses the most accurate timers available and what is certain is that if you use experiment, you always have to um, use the exp.clock at all times in an experiment. So if we have a stimuli demo here, we can use, for example, instead of time.sleep, we use exp.clock.wait. 
And it's important to know if experiment presents stimuli accurately on time, because this is, if you measure response time, this is very important for you. So experiment should and allegedly synchronizes visual stimulus presentation to the refresh rate of the display. And if you have a display with, with a refresh rate of 60 Hertz, which is rather high and normal currently, um, if you don't um, synchronize your stimulus presentation to the refresh rate of the display, you may lag a few frames behind. And every frame is 16.7 milliseconds, um, 1000 divided by 60. And experiment should synchronize the visual stimulus presentation to the refresh rate of the display, which Pygame doesn't. Pygame is just here, graphics card, take this and display it whenever you want, uh, which can be several refreshes later. And experiment makes sure normally that it does that. To the new paper I read, apparently it doesn't do that too well. And because it uses Pygame as backend, and PsychoPy supposedly does that better, better um, but this paper is not peer reviewed yet, so I am not sure. So Pygame doesn't um, synchronize to the refresh rate of the display, so it's several milliseconds uncertain. So according to their own paper, the video latency for Pygame is zero milliseconds using the 60.2 second max update interval on a 60 hertz screen. Audio latency is allegedly between 50 and 20 milliseconds, which is rather good because sound cards don't even allow you to ask when the stimulus was actually done. You just tell the sound card, hey sound card, the next time you're ready, just please um, play the sound for me. And the sound card just says, yeah, whatever. And so report latency is really, really good, um, less than one microsecond. So they benchmarked it themselves using an automatic reaction to a stimulus and there the response time was rather precise. So automatic reaction simply has, they have a robot which uh, basically films the screen and automatically presses a button. But there again, you have many conditions where it may differ because if you're pressing a button on the keyboard, a keyboard adds, a USB keyboard adds 20 to 40 milliseconds of delay again. So you have to use really precise hardware, which is especially made for measuring response times. And if you are, um, if, it's, if response times on millisecond scale are important to you, then you have to use, for example, a button box instead of a USB keyboard because USB keyboards add delay. You have to make sure that you use the right screen, etc., etc. So um, note that what I'm telling you here, so this can add up to easily 100 milliseconds. And 100 milliseconds is already quite a lot if you're measuring response times. And if, it, if you're measuring EEG, it's far too much. Okay. In experiment, make sure that stimuli are accurately presented on time. And there's the preload function. So in um, you have you can preload um, stimuli in experiment, and preload returns the time it took to preload the stimulus. So if you are waiting, make sure that you are subtracting the time that experiment took to preload the stimulus. So you cannot call functions in between. If I'm simply doing something in between here, which takes a few milliseconds, then whatever I'm doing is not going to be a thousand milliseconds later, but a thousand plus however this here took. So make sure that everything you, that you do as little as possible inside presenting the stimulus and make sure that you, for example, all the experiment functions that return how long they took you subtract how long they took from your waiting time. So presenting the fixed cost takes a couple of milliseconds, so we are waiting this less, and preloading the target also takes a couple of milliseconds, so we're also subtracting this from the time we wait. So this is how we do this in um, experiment. And I cannot show you this, but just believe me, it's really precise, you couldn't see the millisecond different anyway. Um, so make sure that you use this if you run your experiment. Okay, and then I also want to show about, I want to show you this, uh, the findings of this new paper. So like I said, it's, it is from the developers of PsychoPy and PsychoPy happens to be by far the best one, which they measured. Hmm. Um, and it's not pre-reviewed yet. So take this with a grain of salt. But what they did was they measured variability and lack of stimulus presentation as well as response logging. And according to this paper experiment, it's really bad. So they measured it for different operating systems and for different um, toolboxes. So here's PsychoPy, um, here's Experiment. And apparently, so 
So they measured the variability and the um, basically a bias how long more this takes. So the variability here is how, how much different was it between the um, different times they tried it and the lag is simply how much more than what allegedly it was. Um, allegedly the stimulus length was it actually was. So we see for example that experiment here is on Ubuntu 23 seconds longer. That's more than one refresh date. And they said um, they that experiment didn't match it to the refresh rate and audio simply sucked in experiment. But PsychoPy here seems to be really precise in comparison to many others. Okay, so I'm just telling you a few things the study pointed out and that is that using the Pygame Python libra library is bad for stimulus presentation because it's not optimized for low latency high precision timing and they don't recommend to use it. How However, by default, even though it's officially deprecated, PsychoPy also uses the Pygame backend. So if you install it the way I told you, which they recommend, you still use the Pygame backend. So you will have the same timing problems. It should also be noted that they said um, there were substantial timing improvements in the latest uh, release of this year from PsychoPy. Yes, so USB keyboard can add delay one extra stream update frame adds delay. Audio presentation sucks in experiment apparently. The further down you present a stimulus, so if you present the stimulus up here because monitors refresh from top to bottom, it can be up to one um, screen update lower, so 60.7 microseconds. Monitors can have settings that act, add extra lag, so make sure to select the gaming settings because they are made to have as little lag as possible. Windows and Mac add lag all the time. And yes, in PsychoPy you should you wouldn't use this coded weight because it's um, imprecise again and it will probably overshoot by one refresh uh, frame again. But PsychoPy has methods um, to show you to make timing really precise. So in the builder view it's simply by setting a checkbox. In the coder view you have to look at that yourself. Um, but generally make sure to use the coded clock and then make sure to use the respective um, functions of that. So for example, the clock.wait method in PsychoPy has this hoc CPU period and this only sleeps for 0.9 for 9.8 seconds for example um, for this case. And then afterwards it continually pulls the clock to get higher precision because what when I showed you here um, this year I said well this isn't imprecise because this process sleeps, then the operating system is doing other things in the one second meantime, and then it comes back to my process too late. So what, uh, what PsychoPy here does, it says, well, come back earlier and then continually be busy by pulling the time. This is bad for your CPU, but good for your timing, because then it um, gets more precise time. Okay, as much for timing, I talked a lot about timing, so let's get to the next topic, and that is data logging.